and welcome to a very special EWTN bookmark with the one and only Raymond Arroyo. Two books, the centenary edition of Mother Angelica, the remarkable story of a nun, her nerve, and a network of miracles, a classic. And also a new book, Turn About Tales, the unexpected light of Thomas Alva Edison. Always great to see you, Ray. Thank you so much for making the time to join us here on Bookmark. Thank you, Doug. D delighted as always to be with you. And I was excited to see, uh, you know, the fact that you have this newer edition of Mother Angelic, which you wrote a kind of a new introduction to, uh, a new preface to. And it's interesting, too, because in the old days, we'd call this a soft cover. But, uh, you know, these days, these are all called paperbacks, right? Yes, they're all called paperbacks. And, you know, this book has never stopped being in print, Doug. Um, you know, there, there's been multiple editions of it. But uh, we thought, because Mother's Centenary was coming up in April, that this would be a good time to write a new foreword. Uh, I even, we're even re-releasing the audiobook. For many years, the audiobook has been out of print. So uh, we added a little new material to it, kind of remastered it, and that's being re-released as well, as well as all the other books I edited for the monastery, uh, the little book of life lessons, uh, mother's uh, uh, private prayers, and uh, and then there's the other book on the on the scriptures, the pri the private and pithy lessons from the scriptures. I'm jumbling all the titles now, but all of them are being re-released and, and all available through the EWTN religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. All things Catholic, got to get that in there. Yep. I understand. No, you have to. And and look, I think the reason that Mother's story continues to fascinate people, and um, well, obviously she herself is fascinating, and because of the reruns, people see her in different right. stages of her life, at, you know, at any moment in the programming day, and they wonder, who is this nun? What's the real story? Well, this is the real story, and uh, I, I get letters all the time from people who didn't realize the hardship she went through in her mm -hmm. early life, how hard it was to build the network and the struggles it took her to actually erect this right. global Catholic network that she envisioned back in the 80s. Uh, it, it's really remarkable that the, a woman like that, I guess that's why we called it the remarkable right. story. Um, it is remarkable that you have a woman like this um, with very limited schooling uh, coming down to the wilds of Birmingham, Alabama, originally from Ohio, and creating there uh, this Catholic enterprise that even now continues mm -hmm. to broadcast to really all of the world. And, uh, you know, it all began with that nun. Right. And, I, and I think her story remains as potent and important today as it did when I wrote it Absolutely. Almost, what, 16, you, you, 17 years ago. Right. That's amazing that it's that long ago. You, you you mentioned in the in, in the in the section in the beginning here the new forward about the idea that you know she's a steady voice in a storm a friend a caring mother and a lot of us feel like the things she's saying today we hear today are actually more prescient than they were when she first said them. Are you also finding, as you said, with people who get in touch with you who aren't even aware that mother's no longer with us? Yeah, no. They, she, it shows you how lively her presence is, and again. Uh, I, I attribute all that to the Holy Spirit. When Mother was saying these things, sometimes when we were on set with her, I mean, I remember nights mm -hmm. when, you know, she, she would start saying something, and it was almost as if the air got sucked out of the room and she would just start talking to the audience, mm -hmm. and it was clear she was being inspired and, and operating on a different level of communication. I mean, everything kind of shifted, her voice, the tone, her pace. Um, and it's those moments that mm -hmm. I think when you watch them now, they have the longest legs. Those are the things that reach into our current age that, at the moment, didn't make all that much sense. But today, right. the pieces have all fallen into place, and you go, oh, this is what she meant. She was warning us about today, not yesterday, 20 years ago when she said this. And many people don't realize Mother has been off the air for more than 20 years now. Um, but it, it's a testament, I think, to her deep spirituality, to the power of the Holy Spirit in this woman's life, that her voice remains as clear as it was then, if not clearer and stronger. And that's what I was getting at there. She remains, I think, that right. comforting presence, that clear presence, and a voice we need urgently today. I wish there were more of them. You also make the point you kind of alluded to earlier over the fact that after all this time, what she built is not nearly as important as how she built it and how her unlikely mission gradually unfolded throughout her life. And you talk about her here as a witness to divine providence. 
you know, or, she said that to me initially. She said, um, you know, everything, everything I've built, everything that we're a part of, this is all due to divine providence. And Mother was a huge believer in divine providence. And I think you see that. And what I was getting at there is, you know, look, people build things all the time. They build mm -hmm. banks, they build towns, they build enterprises and malls. And a few decades later, they get torn down and new ones get built. Um, the how she built this mm -hmm. always intrigued me. And really, this is my own, you know, sort of worldview. I mean, it applies applies to the Edison book I'm writing now. It applies to my, you know, arts background. I'm always interested in, well, how do you get there? How, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Because that, to me, is always more interesting than the thing built. And we dug into that. I'm so privileged, blessed, that Mother gave me that opportunity to sort of uh, look under the hood and find out how she went through this fitful, often painful path to create EWTN and the, the foundational principles mm -hmm. of the network that she put in place, I think, uh, at one point, a support and also a guardrail, a protection for the network and its its future. Um, and all of that we tried to get in the book, and I think we did. I think this, it, uh, it holds this, up well after all these years. You pulled out a great quote here. You have, she once told me that it could be the motto for her entire life. If you are following God, he never shows you the end. It's always a walk of faith. Franciscan virtue is to follow the providence of God, and God's providence goes as far as you go. Now, that's the scary thing about it. If you don't go, he won't go. What has that meant to you in your life and your career? Oh, boy. That, 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 you know, in the midst of these uh, sessions, Doug, and we met probably once a week, sometimes twice a week, uh, I'd interview her about the book over th a three-year period. And in between the interviews, there was gossip about what was happening at the network. Uh, and then we'd wander into spiritual counseling, and she'd talk to me about my, my personal life. And that was something she said to me. I mean, the Little Book of Life Lessons, which is kind of a collection of her spiritual wisdom, a lot of those things she either told the nuns or me personally. And that line was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, because you always, you know, I, I like to know where I'm headed and what's happening. What, where, where am I going? What's next? She said, that's not the way God operates. He only lets you see what the next step is. He never lets you see down the road. But she said, that's the scary thing about it. If you don't go, he doesn't go. So we have a role in this. And, and Mother really taught all of us that, not only me, that um, you have to take the daring step so that God can fill in the gap and take you where he wants you to go. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, that's a work in progress. That's staying close to God's will and, and discerning what he's calling you to, and then having the gut check to go ahead and take the step, no matter how scary it is. And I've done that throughout my life. I mean, all, all the things I've done um, really since meeting Mother, uh, whether it's been my forays into fiction or even writing a biography, Doug, I'd never written a book before. I'd never written a biography before hers. Yeah. So you kind of just step off the ledge, and uh, if it's meant to be, God will catch you. If not, He'll throw you somewhere else that you're supposed to take another leap. Well, you talk about the fact uh, that, as you see throughout the book, she pays a high personal price that Mother paid for telling the truth. And especially in a world we talk about today with where truth is up for grabs, she said, those who tell you the truth love you. Those who tell you what you want to hear love themselves. Goes on to say, it's your obligation to speak the truth, and everyone can either take it or leave it. But truth must be in us. We live in such poverty of the mm. truth today. Yeah. You know, Doug, when she was telling me those things, I guess they were kind of sweet words when I heard them. And I was recording them dutifully and, you know, incorporating them. Uh, it's a lot harder to incorporate into your own life. <laughs> but right. I now look back and think part of part of what that process was of writing the biography and telling her full story, bits of which would have been lost had we not made the decision together to kind of go down this path and work on the book three years before her stroke. Because once that stroke happened, she really couldn't speak at length the way she did before. Um, so much of this story would have just been lost. Right. And I think it's critical and it was providential that it all happened the way it did. But yes, she was teaching, I think, everybody and all of us about the cost of truth. Mm -hmm. I also now reflect on it and think she was warning me about um, my own path and what, uh, 
what lie ahead. Look, telling the truth, <laughs> telling the truth doesn't always get your friends and, and roses thrown in your path. In fact, just the opposite. Look at the first guy who attempted it, okay? Uh, right. You know, th there's a reason we have Holy Week. It's to remind us what truth looks like um, and the way the world receives it. So I think Mother was warning me um, and, and all of us about right. the importance of representing the truth, bringing the truth forward, that that's your obligation but that there is a heavy cost right. for it and to it, and, uh, and that's okay. In right. fact, that's the confirmation that you're doing what you're supposed to do. Well, you even, you talk about her, her, her entrepreneurial style, and you go on to say the inspiration of her book <laughs> is the idea that you can't, you're not good enough, or you lack the training is never her perspective, and, and her life is indicative yeah. of that. And I think that's interesting because your second book uh, the unexpected light of Thomas Alva Edison is also, in a sense, a situation of a young man in some ways thrown out of school early on who was being told, well, you can't be who you'd like to be. Do you see a connection there? Right. You, oh, I see an absolute connection. Look, I'm always drawn to the underdog, uh, Doug. I mean, it's kind of the, you know, it, I, I guess if there's a through line to everything I've ever touched, it's, it's usually about the shunned and neglected, uh, you know, person on the side that everybody looks down on who ends up being the vehicle of salvation and or hope. And, uh, and in the case of Edison, his amazing inventions that we still rely on might never have been possible had it not been, in his own words, for his mother. And that was really what drew me to the work. I, I was reading one of these big, thick Edison biographies, looking for a life to sort of capture for young people, for families. And I found this line, and he said, my mother was the making of me. She allowed me to follow my bent. And if it weren't for, you know, her faith and confidence in me at a particular time in my life, I might never have become an inventor. So I thought, wait a minute, I've never heard this story. What happened here? So I started digging into it, and you realize again, and it's, in some ways, it is like Mother Angelica's story. Right. It's the love of a mother. It's the love of an attention of that mother who saw the possibility in her son, who today we probably would have diagnosed him with ADHD, Doug. I mean, six million people diagnosed with ADHD annually. And, and you know, he was always daydreaming. He couldn't focus. He was, it was hard for him to focus and, and uh, memorize material. But she, Nancy Edison, his mother, realized he had this uh, amazing, curious mind and the ability to keep multiple things in his mind at once. And so she led him down a path of both classical reading as well as scientific journals and uh, electric manuals, things that uh, he was naturally interested in and that he was curious about. And then she gave us all such a great lesson. She told him, you not only learn in your head, you learn with your hands. And that, for me, was the great lesson of this story, that all of us as educators, as parents, as mentors, it's important to, to uh, inculcate children in that lesson, that Yes, book learning is important, but the exploration and the tinkering, the touching, feeling, and sensing is also equally as important. And that lesson stayed with Thomas Edison to the very end of his life and is the reason he created the phonograph, the microphone, the lights we're, we're under today, uh, the, the, the first counting machine, the alkaline battery. I could go on for an hour. Right, absolutely, and she was uh, she was I think an educator uh, herself initially a school teacher, and so she uh, she's a great example of homeschooling ultimately because she she took him when the school was saying he couldn't be educated and said I'll take care of it myself. A lot of mothers are doing that out there in this world. Doug, today. I don't know why every homeschooling parent doesn't have a picture of Edison on the wall. He's like the patron saint of homeschooling. I mean, this is a kid thrown out of school, told he was addle-brained and couldn't be taught. His own father thought he was a dunce, probably because he was withdrawn. He, he had hearing loss, too, heavy hearing loss at the age of 12, which in his own words, drove him to reading, and, and he had a very lively interior life. And again, that mind, he, he was allowed to ponder things and focus on them in a deep way. Um, so again, you see, the, the thing the world shuns ends up being the blessing in this life and the portal to his entire vocation. And that's really what the Turnabout Tales series is about. Right. Every book in the series, this is only the first, will highlight those crisis points in a young life. 
um, you know, the motto for the series is challenges faced, paths altered, mm -hmm. and history turned. And that's really what every one of our lives is about, but particularly these great lives that we shouldn't ignore, we shouldn't forget. And I, I think they're just lessons there that not only we need, but our children right. need as well. And um, God forbid we let those vanish into the ether of time. They're too important. Right. I'm assuming in researching this and the other books you're, you're working on, what you find is that all of these highly successful people all have had that moment. There were things that happened in their lives. It wasn't this, I start here and it's just a successful run up. There's some turnaround. There's some change. Right. Well, like deviation. Mother Angelica, you know, the, the, yeah, well, the, you know, the tragedy in the moment, the crisis in the moment ends up being the portal and the entire opening to what their vocation was, what they're intended to do. It opened up not only their entire destiny, but our history. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think of this kid who couldn't properly read. In fact, when you read Edison's letters, Doug, there were grammatical errors and misspellings all over them. He never really wrote well because he didn't have that book learning, if you will. He was a tinkerer. He was a, uh, he challenged himself and would build on others' failures. In fact, he used to say, sticking to it is the genius. Mm -hmm. Sticking to it is the genius. He didn't see himself as some great genius. He, he, he created through a process of elimination. And when I look back at whether it's Mother Angelica or it's Henry Ford or it's Steve Jobs, what they all have in common is they never give up, they mm -hmm. stay in the riddle, they stay in the crisis until it's solved, and it is a process of elimination. They don't have all the answers. And I think so many young people think, well, the door just opens and I'm famous and wealthy and all of my dreams come through. No, that's not the way life works. And in the case of Edison, a man who every time you pick up your cell phone, that's Edison you have to thank for that phone. Uh, the, the speaker, the receiver, the microphone, all of that was his creation. That might never have happened had he given up. And that's the true lesson at the heart of this turnabout tale, I think. It, it's also interesting, too, because even Edison, as you talk about in the book, uh, indicates that many times he would pick up what other people were working on that they hadn't succeeded, and then he saw, can I make this work? Right. Right. He was building on. He often said, I, I don't have all the answers, but I know 60,000 ways that don't work. And that's a good thing, because now I have now I can build on that. So he built on others failures. People think, oh, he created the light bulb. Actually, mm -hmm. the arc light, you know, moving electricity mm -hmm. from two arcs that was already created by the time Edison came along. What Edison gave us was a vacuum tube and a conductor of light, a conductor of the current that could stay lit, the incandescent bulb. That was his contribution. So he, today we think of him as creating the light bulb. Actually, he perfected the light bulb, as he did the microphone and so many other things. Um, but it shows you his tenacity, more than a thousand patents, all from a child. Some of his contemporaries thought of as dumb, Adelbrained, right. and even his own father, a Duns. Right. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't discount anybody, is the point. And we shouldn't give up on people or up on the things we're about or think we're called to. Sometimes that difficulty, that pit in the road, that challenge is the path that, that you're being right. set on. And you have to work through it. You have and, to keep going. And you never know who your inspiration is going to be. Who's the Mad Miller of Milan? <laughs> well, this was a guy who lived. I mean, this is what people think creation, you know, invention is such a, a nice, solemn activity and no one's disturbed by it. No, it's a disaster, particularly in this era. You know, this is not the modern era. This is the turn of the century. Uh, there was a guy up the road from Edison when he was a boy. Uh, called the Mad Miller of Milan, Sam Winchester. He was actually a miller. He had a mill, you know, a mill operation. But his hobby was trying to create a balloon that could actually carry people. So he was experimenting with hydrogen, and he, too, burned down his barn in the experimentation. And Edison was fascinated and would go watch him through the glass every day working, you know, pressing his face up to the window, watching this guy experiment with hydrogen. As a little boy, he watched the miller do this. And it was no doubt an inspiration to him later. And Edison, as a boy, Doug, blew up his basement, torches the family barn. Uh, um, he, he blows up a baggage car that he's working on the train, uh, you know, when he's working on the train. So he was a combustible creator. He was a hands-on creator. It wasn't always clean or pretty, but 
He got the job done. And his mother had the patience to let him go and make those mistakes and sort of guide him uh, in a proper path. And I think that's what we're all called to do as parents. Find the, the passion of that child, lean into it, and discover how that child learns and accommodate it. Right. We, we, this cookie-cutter education that we have in so many areas of, of, of the educational establishment, I think, is a big mistake, not only for us, but for our kids. I love your line, the current of ingenuity surged through him. Yeah, that's true. That's a great no, image. He, he had that. I, I, I equated, yeah, there, there, at the beginning of the book, um, the first line is something like, um, it, you know, he, was in a, he grew up in a windowless attic, a dark windowless attic, but there was light in him. So once I, I opened that way, I, I, I said, I've got to continue that sort of poetic line that, you know, the light was within him. It's not just the light that he put in the bulb. It, the, the, the light, the ingenuity, uh, the creativity was always there. Right. It was merely a matter of unlocking it and finding a way to do that and giving him, you know, free reign, which his mother, Nancy Edison, right. was the first to do. That's the first turnabout tale. The second is a good deed he does for a little boy in the middle of the book. Um, and I think these lessons, kids, I've been reading this book to a lot of children, Doug. I'm amazed by their reaction to it. Uh, they understand. They get it. One of the things that struck me in this book, and actually in Mother Angelica's book, is you basically dedicated both of them to the same people. To all the mothers like Rebecca and Linda, I do. your mom, who see the promise in their children long That's before true. the world does. And I thought, well, that fit the uh, Edison. But I realized when I picked up the Mother Angelica, it was, it was the same. And, and so that connection, you must have connected yeah. right away to the idea of the mother's support in, in this story as well, right? Look, I've been blessed with mothers my whole life. My birth mother, uh, Mother Angelica, my first agent, Loretta Barrett, was, a, was a really my literary mother. Uh, I, I've been very blessed um, having these great, you know, matronly and, and maternal figures in my life. Uh, and, and so I guess it does resonate with me. Mm -hmm. And certainly with Edison, if it wasn't for this woman, and a woman at that time, that was not an easy path either. You know, she was not the leader in the household. She was not the leader in the community. And to sort of defy uh, the local teacher as well as her own husband and uh, to accommodate and help her boy, th that took an enormous amount of courage. Now, I can't get into all of that in the book, but it's alluded to. And when he loses his mother, um, you know, he, and as Edison said, I didn't have her for very long, but she really shaped his entire, the way he learned and the way he read, um, which was deeply and quickly uh, and, and practically. He, he was always creating things that were practical. I didn't know Edison created the first voting machine, Doug, mm -hmm. which he did, uh, but he couldn't sell it to anybody. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he decided, I will never create anything that doesn't have an audience and a consumer base. And he was good to that promise right up to the very end. And, and, and the indication is, even from what you, you say in the book, is that in a lot of ways he was driven forward by that love of his mother and wanting to kind of live up to her expectations for him. Yeah, to prove himself to her, mm -hmm. to prove that, that her faith in him was warranted. And, uh, and, and I think that's part of what drove him. You see him pushing and pushing and pushing himself, and and these the, what he called the muckers, the uh, you know the guys who worked in the in the lab with him, they would experiment and work on multiple projects. Um, but uh, the other fascinating part of this is, isn't it curious and maybe providential, that the man who creates the phonograph and the microphone is functionally deaf when he does so. Um, in fact, I, I read one story where when he was listening to the phonograph, he created a board, like a, a wooden board that he would attach to the phonograph, and he'd bite down on it because that's how he would hear. It was through the resonators of his bones, sort of like the, the, those implants, those Kohler implants right. they, they, um, uh, you know, they, they put it in people's skulls. He was doing that basically at the turn of the century. Uh, but it was how he could hear fully or at least approximate hearing. Um, but he never gave up. And, his, and the, the, his failings or the things he didn't have were never used as excuses to stop or let somebody else right. handle it. That right. was not so the way Edison rolled. You have the quote, every wrong attempt discarded is another step forward. Just before we go, beautiful illustrations, which we've been showing several during the program. Uh, uh, Christina Germann, is she the illustrator? Germann, yeah. Okay. She did and a how'd beautiful you pick her job. Up? A German artist. Right. 
Well, uh, Christina came to us. I, I loved her backgrounds. You know, she, she really captures the historical accuracy of the settings in the book, which I loved. Um, and she has a real fine attention to detail, which appealed to me for this particular story. Uh, and we wanted, I also wanted the story, and it is, a little slapstick. There's fun, there's light. Um, and you also see, again, that framing of the turnabout tale, I think keeps you focused mm -hmm. on uh, the growth of, of Edison, the great challenges that young people are inevitably going to face. And it gives us all inspiration and I think a little hope. Uh, in addition to being a fun read, which I wanted it to be. So uh, can you let us in on what the next one might be or when we might see that? Okay, I'll give you a little teaser. I can't talk about it yet, but, I, but I'll give you this teaser. It is about the son of a president at a critical juncture in American history, and um, he was much more important than I ever imagined, not only historically, but um, to a practice that we continue to this very day, a neglected bit of history. And all of these turnabout tales will feature individuals or people that have either, either been forgotten or bits of their lives, bits of important history that's been overlooked that I think we need to capture. So every turnabout tale will be dedicated to a different life. Well, if somebody's got to capture it, might as well be you, Ray. That would be great. Always a wonderful job. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raymond Arroyo. Two wonderful books, a centenary you, edition Doug. of Mother Angelica, The Remarkable Story of a Nun, Her Nerve and a Network of Miracles. If you haven't read this book, you've got to read it. And Turnabout Tales, The Unexpected Light of Thomas Alva Edison, both available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. Thank you so much for joining us here on EWTN's Bookmark. We shall catch you next time. Thanks.